Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to a John Hansard Gallery talk with artist Neva Mali. I apologise for the slight technical issues we had um, just there. I guess this, this whole lockdown pandemic period is a time of, a time of delays and deferrals, so maybe that's, maybe that's appropriate, but thanks for bearing with us. This evening's talk is connected to John Hansard Gallery's online exhibitions programme, which is supported by the Barker Mill Foundation, and JHD would like to thank their funders and supporters who've enabled JHD to continue to generate exciting content like this throughout these very challenging times. Joining Neuve in today's talk are myself, Sarah Hayden, Associate Professor in Literature and Visual Culture at the University of Southampton, and Dr. Daniel Sid, Associate Professor of Design Studies at the University of Southampton, Winchester School of Art. Glass House was originally made as a two-screen video installation and has been specially reformatted for John Hansard Gallery's new digital programme. The work is an intimate study of landscape, light and glass that was originally created during a residency in Denmark after Amali happened upon a row of old greenhouses. From inside those greenhouses, the camera pans across discoloured and broken panes of glass, looking through to wild grasses and overgrown weeds beyond. By re-examining Glass House during the current pandemic, these abandoned spaces and obscured exteriors echo our withdrawal from view during the lockdown, only to be revealed during moments of absolute clarity when the glass is removed. If you haven't seen the work yet, Glass House can be viewed online at JHG's website, and that's jhg.art. Audience members are going to have the opportunity to post questions in the chat window on Zoom, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can in the last maybe 15 or 20 minutes or so of this event. So to get us started then, I've asked Neve to introduce Glass House, if you would, to tell us a little bit about the work and about its composition. Thanks, Neve. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, um, it, I did um, think a lot about what we might show online because as, as has been said, I was supposed to have an exhibition in the John Hansard opening in July, so that's being postponed till next year where I'm very much looking forward to being able to travel again. But the, having looked through a few of the films which are, are never normally viewable online and, and normally kind of, uh, it feels really important that they're in the context of an exhibition with objects so it was it was it took a bit of you know considering as to what would work um because i'm quite interested in the idea that they get their scene out of the corner of your eye as you move around through sculptures and, and that there's something which kind of provoke a certain movement and viewing um but some somehow i'm using the kind of canvas of the screen and replacing the two screens on on it they would normally be monitors in the space it seemed to um, it seemed to function quite well. It seemed to be, an, I think, moving image works well online. And and in, compared to a lot of, you know, I found a lot of the online viewing rooms and things very frustrating at this time. They just make you long to touch things, and long to see things in reality. But moving image felt like it could it could work. And the piece was made. I was uh, um, on residency in Denmark, and I visited a friend, an artist friend, Eamon O'Kane, who happened to have bought this like house on, 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 on land covered in old greenhouses. And I immediately kind of, I, I basically sent him a big long email a few hours later with the exact kind of description of what I would really like to do and then managed to, to get the people I needed to help me to do it. it. It just allowed for this single tracking shot because there were really long spaces. And I wanted this sense of, of you traveling left to right ad, 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 ad infinitum, I suppose. So I had this, even from the beginning, I imagine two screens, but as the piece evolved, staggering the, 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 the shots opened up this really kind of exciting space for me where you were filling the gap in between and you were imagining the spaces as if they would make sense, as if they folded in and out of each other. And there's kind of deliberate disjuncture in it too, where the pace shifts from one side to the other. So it's not too, I hope, seductive and, 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 and rhythmic in the sense that it sometimes jolts against that. Um, so a lot of things were to do with, with finding the right place, but having some idea in mind. I don't tend to location hunt, it just kind of, it was the right place. So yeah, I don't know if that's given some background. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's the sense of the lucky happenstance of, of how the work came to be is really helpful mm -hmm. for, an, for an audience to know in, in encountering it. Um, and some of what you were talking about there in terms of the sense of, of transit and that kind of movement within it kind of, um, I think sort of, Prompts me to think of something that Daniel was thinking about in relation um, to the work, perhaps. Daniel, if you'd like to. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Because, well, it's a beautiful work. It's uh, exquisite. It, to some extent, hypnotic. 
Mm. Um, two screens that are two windows uh, showing a succession of windows is a fascinating exploration of, of the window substance, in my opinion, right? It's a kind of a, we're talking about this, the, the laminar border quality of, of this architectural element, that, that the house is in the garden and the garden is part of the house. The garden is like the exterior on the other side, but at the same time is, is part of the interior of the space. It is not a door and the transit is not physical, but it's mental, right? And, mm. and, and, and is an, an, an act in an, an inactive action that on that case is animated. Uh, um, so for me, just fascinating, also because I'm very interested, as you know, in Windows. But could you speak a little about the presence of Windows in your work and especially on Glasshouse? Yeah, I mean, they've definitely been a consistent thing. And I think it's taken me a while to figure out why, but um, they seem to, I think glass in itself, it sort of points to visibility. It's sort of telling you to look. It's, it's like a command to look, you know, the, the glass. So if it wasn't there, weirdly, it's it's almost, it's very resurfacing of the space and distancing that it, that it places on it, um, prompts a kind of, you know, um, a visibility, actually. It's sort of says, be visible, be seen to, to something behind it. And I, I just think that's kind of really um, particular and amazing, especially because, you know, it's quality, even if you hold up like, to two millimeter picture framing glass in, in your hand. It's kind of resurfacing the world behind it and sort of making it like image making, I suppose. It's an image maker. Um, and I mean, I think it's also particularly, I've often thought about it in a car, you know, it's particularly present as you, as you drive, if you drive, you know, that the windscreen becomes a screen, that it, it, it's sort of becoming an image space. So. So yeah, windows are, 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 are doing more than protecting us in a kind of physical sense. They're kind of pointing to the image space behind them. And in that way, it's problematic as well, probably, you know, because it's, it's distancing everything. It's making it safe and uncontrollable, but it's totally fascinating. Yeah. I don't know if that's <laughs> answered. <laughs> yes, definitely. I think when you, when you talk about the sense of, of how the window kind of makes something safe or, or kind of Mm. Uh, places it at some distance, the kind of degree of abstraction that's there. I know that sort of thinking about the the arrival of this work into this online exhibition right now, that I was very conscious of the fact that the work was obviously originally conceived as this two-channel piece. And I think that some reviewers and respondents, um, when they first saw it, really talk, spoke about the kind of significance of the fact that we saw these two screens and the space between it was really, the space between the two screens was really significant. And I think in your own thinking about the work too, and then for JHG, you then reconceived it as this single screen piece. And there's something I think really kind of potent and suggestive about the idea of you doing that over the past few months of this kind of being produced or reproduced and almost that like kind of resurfaced in a new way, reframed in this moment where lots of people are behind glass in different ways, where we're thinking a lot about screens and kind of being separated from or um, visible through screens that might protect us or protect others. Could you talk a little bit about the process, um, I guess, of reconceiving the work for this exhibition, of reconceiving it to be digitally viewable, also to be viewable within people's own homes? You know, this is a work we consume domestically. We're, we're, we're speaking about the work in our own home spaces right now and what it was to think, to rethink this work um, in the context of the pandemic and doing it right now. I mean, it's the kind of joy of returning to your own works, like as if you've never made them and being able to see them recontextualized. And for me too, I was I was looking at it a lot and and thinking about you know because I had this this notion when I was making it of of that 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 thing when you roll down the car windscreen and and the, the no, both the noise and the noise of the real kind of comes crashing in. And I wanted to make a piece where that was that was somehow more potent, where there was layers of, of, of opaqueness, of obscurity, and then those moments where there is clarity, where you can potentially see through, or, or it feel kind of too much or something. And now that they feel just like full of, you know, the madness and the, 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 the stuff of the world that we're trying to shield from, and, and that, that those gaps feel more dominant and more, um, yeah, more potent, I guess. and and. Yeah, and the, and the idea of a gap, you know, is it something, is it sort of positive space or negative space? You know, how is it functioning? Is it something we're filling with our eyes or is it something that's that's containing something? But it's it's certainly, so even though it is, it's sort of seductive, it's, 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 it's sort of quite a 
kind of hypnotic piece, as you said, Daniel, to, to, to watch in some ways. I think there are moments of, of jokes and, and, and that's maybe, I think somebody said, as we were chatting the other day about, about the gaps when you go to the supermarket in the, in the perspex screens and, you know, in some ways, I think you're, you know, you're looking at those gaps going, this is not functioning, <laughs> this is not safe, but you're also maybe partly tempted to speak through them because they feel, otherwise you, you, you can recognize the fact that we are not present in, 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 the, in the space with the, with the other person. We're not like in that real world, you know? So, so what is the function of the gaps there? But it definitely seems more um, to mean a lot more now, or to mean something different at least. Yeah. It's, it's very telling that you talk about it in terms of this kind of human interactions and, and to that you started out by talking about sort of the sort of, I suppose, the, the frustration that we might feel at looking at some online exhibitions and wanting to be bodies in the space um, mm. with the works. And I think, you know, looking back through a lot of your kind of practice over over years, how you, you come back to glass in all these different sorts of ways as screen, but also as material. That sort of that I think that... Um, Isabel Harbison talks about your sort of interest in lines of vision and there's a sense in which your kind of your work can seem very kind of materially focused and yet it's very much about a human kind of correspondence with and interaction with that material about the sort of the objecthood of the glass but also of our relation to its to its objecthood our relation to its materiality could you talk maybe a little bit about sort of aside from windows as such but also just about glass as material and the kind of the ways that you put it in the gallery and sort of presence it why you do that? Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I started using it properly, I suppose, when I, when I wanted to film through it. So I, I, was, I was wanting to, to video a piece where I was painting onto thin pieces of glass and putting it in front of the camera. And um, it's really difficult because it's full. It catches reflections, it catches light, it catches dust and finger marks, and it's a complete nightmare, basically. You know, don't even try it. But <laughs> I don't know how they did it years ago with all those beautiful matte paintings in cinema. But it, it just, it actually, of course, made me more and more conscious of its, of its objecthood, you know? And, and as I was saying earlier to Daniel, it, it's sort of something which per, sort of speaks of invisibility, you know, like as if it doesn't exist. It, it's, it's pretending it doesn't exist, but then you lay it flat, it's a thing. And it's molten, becomes solid. It's, it's, it's all of those things. And it just, you know, and then I kind of thought a lot, I use, I've used some colored glass in, in the work as well. And, I mean, there's wonderful texts about in in its use in stained glass. It was never meant to be seen through, you know. It was it was meant to provoke a kind of interiority in, in a space. It was never meant to be, you know, to be an access point. It was meant to keep, hold you in, and and also how we we used to like falling on things. So when light comes through things, we, we're just distracted by the brightest spots almost. So we can't actually read kind of surfaces of of say stained glass or colored glass very well because we keep the you know keep our eyes flicker to, to the points of where the light is coming through um, so it's a really complex material which is which is both object with light falling on it and 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 you know object with light coming through it and I think that's quite distracting physically and, you know in, in terms of something that's a presence in front of you so yeah so I have thought a lot about it, it has a thing <laughs> You surely have. I, I wondered, did Daniel have a thought maybe on that in terms of thinking about sort of the material, many, the immaterial in glass? Many questions also about uh, <laughs> the thing you said about the stained glass. Then maybe and then, then later we could talk about this because it's really looking at the interior instead, in, instead of the, the exterior. But mm. because we are talking about the materiality of glass, let's talk about the immateriality of, of glass, right? Because uh, um, the, the, the glass lets in the light through the window at the end. Uh, um, it's true that it's brittle, it breaks easily, um, but when it's clean, it is at, at if it is not there, right? In fact, we say cleaning windows, uh, when we should say cleaning glass windows most of the time, right? So it, it makes evident that, that at the window, this, this space is made of um, nothing. It's, a, it's an empty space. In fact, it's, it's precisely this trivi triviality the almost not existence of the window, the glass when it's clean that explains its importance, right? It's isn't it a clear example of the greatness of nothing to uh, um, the effectiveness of emptiness? I know that probably now this sounds very Oriental thinking, but did you have this? Uh... Yeah, I guess it's it's 
I mean, in some ways, I completely disagree because I think it, it, it is, never, is never not there. I mean, if you've ever experienced a window being glazed in an empty house, it's like an amazing revelation. <laughs> you know, it's just like you put it in and somehow then you can see everything. It's like you can't deal with the emptiness, you know. So it's, 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 it's pointing to it, but in a way that we can handle it or something. So I agree that it is, it's, it's pointing or, 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 you know, making you, bringing your attention to space but in a way which gives us a kind of control or a sense of, of coating, literally a coating over that, you know? And um, yeah, so it's, it's, so it's, so that's why, you know, this idea of making glass house and sort of talking about it, it, it's there and then it's not there. And what is, what is the difference? You know, what is that, what is that giving us, you know, to open the window <laughs> in comparison to having it shut, you know? And I think quite something quite dramatically different. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe you'd like to say a bit more about about. No, 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 no. It was no, no. It was yeah, just thing. yeah. <laughs> no, just because this uh, they make real that the house is made not is not made of overture. It's made of uh, it's it made is not made of walls. It's made of overture, right? Yeah, and we, yeah it's and made then, of cast. Yeah, and we and this is because a house is a house because we can we can go in and out uh, yeah. with the, with the. Um, using the doors but also the windows in a in a more mental way right yeah for sure so um well that was uh that was i was feeling when i was looking at your at your film i think as, as we're talking we're sort of shifting between thinking about sort of physical spaces in quite a still way and we, and we keep coming back at the same time the sense of transit to like you say going in and out to the fact that those apertures are animated by our own motion um and i suppose that sort of watching glass house i was really struck by how you you manage this kind of movement between motion and stillness and you know you talked about the work being kind of avoiding a kind of seductiveness or kind of not becoming so easy to watch because it has these sort of stops and starts um and and those are something that i think that nadia's essay um nadia's curatorial essay on the work really draws out the kind of sense in which you handle these kinds of stops and starts um, could you talk a little bit about how you think about sort of motion and moving image, particularly in your practice, because you do work across so many different modes and yet this sort of um, attention to movement is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I started working with moving image quite a long time ago and when I'd been working in painting, really, and, um, and I'd actually started making kind of paintings, contextual paintings, I suppose, in, in gallery environments and other environments, um, which were very much activated as you moved around the space. Um, and then it just seemed to, I kind of wanted to contain that in a work. So I thought about extending the painted object, I suppose, into, into a film space. Um, so that's when I, I, I began to work with it. Um, but it was, it's been really nice and it's been partly technology because I was never that keen on the kind of dark space, you know, the cinematic space with this sort of, you know, a bench and, 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 and this sort of focused view of a film. I was quite excited at the point where you could put things on screens and they functioned like objects in the same sort of surface sort of um, quality as, as the sculptures in a way, you know, that they were all kind of equal, but mm -hmm. somehow that there was this, um, movement this animated quality in some of them which which changes your own it changes your own experience of moving around a gallery if something else is activated you know and it kind of reminds you i think of the stillness of things you know and it kind of it it, it makes you aware of your body because you're as soon as something moves you actually become quite still <laughs> you actually you know your response is to is to stop and to, to allow that extended space to, to happen to roll out and I, I, so I'm quite curious about the kind of, you know, bringing those things together and having having things in a gallery which are which are kind of cultivating a, a sense of, of of movement in 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 your own mind or experience in your viewing experience. But then as you move away from them, you're kind of conscious of the stillness or the objecthood of other things. And I've really enjoyed working with moving image more since I've been able to have the things that carry it, the objects. So most recently I had this huge kind of fabulous LED screen, which was just a real thing, you know, and, and that felt like an appropriate kind of carrier of, of movement. Um, does that, yeah. <laughs> it does, it, it, it absolutely does, because I think that sort of the way that you're, you're speaking about moving image now sort of makes me understand differently 
sort of, I suppose, some of those earlier works of yours where you were projecting moving image onto paintings. And there's something almost like kind of like there's a moment of kind of transgression, even in just doing that. That sort of like we think about artists working between media and yet sort of like to mix the media in the work kind of produces this little kind of frisson. And like, I suppose I'd be kind of interested, maybe it's a cheeky question to ask um, online, but you know, how did people respond to that? Or kind of how did curators or institutions respond when you said, I'm going to have this painting and I'm going to project onto it? Did that feel like a sort of a crossing of a line in a way? Or, or how did you think about it? Or Yeah, I mean, it felt like a ridiculous act in the making because it was almost like uh, so to make them I was I mean they're quite old works now but to make them I was projecting onto a canvas and I was painting elements of of the piece so almost like I was kind of holding the light that you know in points where it fell um so there was this weird thing of trying to hold it still while letting it roll out and and it was it was quite a, a strange um it felt like it, it was built for failure and in a sense they all did. They, there's a deliberate collapse in all those pieces where they, they kind of get revealed and the painting looks so shoddy and so kind of pathetic in its effort <laughs> to make an image. And, and equally, so does the film, you know, it's like they're both failing and that was the point. So that was the point of bringing them together was to kind of have a conversation about that, how, how neither of them were successful in rendering anything close to, to, to any sort of capture, I guess. Uh -huh. um, so, and on a really practical level, they're very difficult to line up. <laughs> so, so curators, you know, <laughs> they've kind of been, they were the bane of my life for a while. <laughs> no, I, would, I wouldn't like to be the one in charge of twiddling with the uh, projector on that. No, no, that's not the projector. I suppose when you're talking about that sort of sense of, of the work, you know, being about the sort of these kind of attempts and the impossibility of full capture, it kind of, I suppose, throws us on to your, I think it's 2017 film, Maven, too. And sort of the, the sense in which there is a glass, a yeah, piece of glass being held within a moving car as you're filming the kind of the approach to a mountain in Mayo. Um, but that on the glass, there is this, this mark that kind of holds the glass in front of us and keeps it visible. Um, could you maybe say a little bit about maybe how you understand the relationship between Maven and Glass House in terms of those kind of concerns or how they overlap. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think I, I was thinking about the fact that I'm often filming something incredibly still, and sometimes it's with a fixed camera shot, and, and you know, but I'm not really filming much happening, <laughs> essentially. Um, even as I track past the, the, Greek, the glass house, you know, there's a few bits of like there's a little bit of wind. Um, but in, in, and in Nathan, it's 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 quite a strange one because there's this it's a really active process. It, even though the car was moving incredibly slowly and sort of circumnavigating this mountain and trying really hard, the, the, what we tried to do is to, we had, a, I mean, we had a crazy rig hanging off a van, trying to keep the piece, the piece of glass was held in a, in a box in front of the camera and we were trying to keep that dot. There's a painted black mark on the glass and we're trying to keep that on the mountain. And, and I mean, in a way we were, we were being, we were being forced by the road, which became a kind of track, I guess. You know, the car is a dolly and we're, we're being forced, you know, off, off the subject all the time. But the subject becomes so ridiculously still and static and, and like exists in such a different time space. It, it really does speak to the absurdity of the act. You know, the fact that you cannot see this thing. You know, we can never see it. It's just a completely different... It, it just can, can exists in such a different space to us. So, so really, that's what that's what the piece was was really trying to conjure for me, at least, um, was that effort and that kind of inherent failure. Um, but it was it was pointed. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, that kind of sense of of the failure is something maybe that we experience when we're watching glass house the kind of the failure to try to understand how it quite all lines up the kind of mm -hmm. you know, I think that Daniel was talking about the sort of sense of the, the the infinite and the sort of how we might think about the moving image in glass house in relation maybe to fresco and the sort of the sort of sense of how we can hold this huge long stream um, in the mind's eye do you want to say anything on that Daniel yeah it's true that somebody in fact somebody compare your project with uh, Francesco di Assisi frescos uh, <laughs> That is true that they are immediate in the world. Uh, it's a kind of counter figure of the architectural window, right? Uh, it's a, a window that is op open to the 
to a world that is truer than the real world, according to the Neoplatonic theology of light, focus on the interior uh, dimension. And uh, it's true that then in the Renaissance, the painting was consider, conceived literally as a window yeah. open to the world, representing things as they are seen. But then in contemporary times, it, it does not seem to occupy, occupy this position anymore, the window, right? In fact, in, let's say, paintings like Rothko's, they recall to the great medieval stained glass windows, right? In a way, it's uh, this more interior light, the interior dimension of light. But it seems that this is still uh, an idea, uh, an ideal resource to reflect on the very nature of painting of art, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems, I mean, the, for me, frescoes, you know, this idea of, of something being absolutely contained within the surface you know just just and I, I've often even though I've made kind of painted elements on on glass I, I they've always seemed so um so temporary and tentative you know you can you make a mark and you can see the underside of the mark and you can see the other side but it could be scraped or pulled off it and in contrast to that I've also made these works which are which are embedded in their own surface and in, in a way I think of the the wooden pieces I make as that as well. It's like the, the, the stain is, is in the surface, they're sanded, they're polished. And I am quite interested in the container, you know, the, the surface that you're working with is being a real container of things. And like and for me, frescoes in particular, you know, they're not they're not the images, they're the walls, you know, yeah. and, and, and even if they function as windows, it, they're the buildings, you know, they're 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 just they're heavy and weighty in their in their solidness and in their specificity. Um, uh, and yeah, I think there's something very powerful about the pigment and the, and the, and the wall kind of merging and, and becoming one. I'm, yeah, I did actually paint a window on a wall in Siena a long time ago. It's just, it's just come back to me. A <laughs> kind of a fresco. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Doing the same thing 20 years later. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's nice to think, like I think moving image, just coming back to something functioning online, I think you can put moving image on a screen online because the, the mediums match, right? Um, and, and that's why I think certain works sort of function in some way. So it's like online viewing glass house is okay because it can become the surface of its container and it, it sort of makes sense. It's, it's a filmic process re reproduced as such and therefore somehow it sits well into its, into its wall and it becomes an appropriate window. Okay. It's, I, I feel like this is probably a little bit too, too flippant, but I feel like we're, we're further and far enough on in the conversation to make the analogy. But I was, I was looking up a, a recipe for risotto last night and the end of the recipe, the, whoever had posted the, the recipe um, said, if anyone has tips for how to photograph risotto, I'd really appreciate it because you know, I can't photograph it right. It, it never looks like specific enough in its risotto-ness. And I think, I think a lot of, you know, I think a lot of work that we're seeing maybe online right now, we have a sudden sense of the, the risotto-ness of the risotto is not getting captured by the image. Um, and yet Glasshouse seems to exist like very, you know, in its new form, it seems to be entirely kind of perfectly sighted on the screen as we see it at the moment. I think particularly maybe because when we think of kind of, of how windows exist in our own homes, you know, they, they kind of, they offer an alternative view on what we're kind of sit seated, like seated in or occupied with. Um, and I was really conscious watching Glass House the first time I was sitting outside. And so I was kind of shifting my attention between watching the screen and watching the kind of the world outside at the same time. And, and somehow I think that seeing it in a gallery might be a very, very different experience, but yes. at the same time seeing it on the screen and watching it within our own screen and with the capacity for us to have multiple tabs open and to shift between and the fact that it's looped in the way that it is kind of allows us to kind of think about what all those kinds of viewing experiences are and how we properly experience them, how we kind of experience them in a very embodied way and one that's, that's always kind of, we're always with one eye to the window and one eye to what we're doing. You're kind of looking out, checking the weather and, and that's there in the work as yeah, it is. It is yeah. Yeah, I think it is there in the work, and it's there in in, cur in more current work in this idea that we're holding we're holding our images and we're gathering our images in a particular way. You know, and I I shot the last piece, that last moving image piece on on foam, <laughs> and I'm I'm really you know. Um, we are literally surrounded and we're speaking into containers of images and we can't ignore that as something that's affecting how we're 
how we're understanding the world. So it, it just feels, but I love the fact that we are drifting off them, you know, to, to our actual windows as well. And that this is, oh my God, I can see our window reflected in my window. Right yeah. Now. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, that's kind of magic. <laughs> that's <laughs> worth the totally planned, totally planned. <laughs> Like I to set that up, line it up right. Um, <laughs> thinking about when you're drawing attention to the window like that, Neve, and I'm aware that I'm seeing like the lush kind of verdure behind um, behind Daniel and behind yourself, and I've got like a slightly a grey and a grey and green vista out beyond. Um, that sort of your work. I think when people write about it, people often comment on the sort of sense of the restraint uh, um, that you exercise in, in how you compose in the palette is very sort of refined. And, and greenhouse, sort of glasshouse, obviously summons the greenhouse that was the site of its of its making. And yet the piece is black and white, um, even though, as I think Brian Dillon points out, it's a very lustrous black and white, mm -hmm. right? And it's black and white that kind of tempts us and tantalizes us with the idea of the greenness that we're not seeing and the kind of the, the liveness that we're not um, we're not smelling. We're not sort of we're not in a, a haptic contact with it either. And I think that there's, there's an awful lot of your work that sort of uses kind of natural materials. You think about like beech or oak as well as glass, um, lots of materials that are derived from growing things. Could you speak a little bit about that, about the kind of sense of the botanical or the arboreal or the kind of the green stuff and how it comes up in your work, even though you contain your, your palette in the way that you do? Yeah, I mean, to speak first to the palette, I suppose. I mean, yeah, I do get asked a lot um, about why things are black and white. They're not all black and white, actually, but <laughs> lots are. Um, and mostly it's simply, there's just too much information. I mean, it, 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 I, can't, I don't think you can, you can attend to everything at once. I mean, and you know that thing if you're trying to take a picture of something and, I, and you get the picture back and then the flattening of the image plane, there's loads of other things at the same surface level and nobody's looking at the thing that you were taking. I mean, it's, it's simply that, or it's fair, you know, it's choosing a palette. It's, it's, so there's a lot of things taken out. You know, there's a framing for one thing, obviously. There's uh, sand has ta been taken out and, and the color, because in, in a piece like Glass Eyes, I mean, I always film in color because you get more technical information and then make a decision. But in this case, I had the monitor in black and white. I mean, I knew, I knew it would be black and white. But I mean, literally at certain points, a, a green coming through too strongly from a particular plant just, just gives you way too much information, you know, and stops this kind of um, spare kind of uh, attention to these layers that I wanted to, to focus on. So it's often just a point of focus. But the other kind of part of the question, which is maybe a broader question about maybe landscape or, or, or nature, I mean, I mean, it's something I've, I've thought about and worked on for a very long time, and it is really the crux of what I do, even if sometimes it seems like the sculptures are further away from that. But I'm, I'm, really, I'm really kind of convinced that, that, that it, landscape is part of what forms our, our kind of inherent positioning, our, our location, you know, and I mean this in terms of where we stand, where we feel comfortable. There's, there's ideas like that, that ideal kind of spaces give you a prospect and a refuge, you know, somewhere where you can see to be safe and somewhere where you can, you, you can, you know, hide. So, so I, I, I'm quite interested that all of those kinds of um, intuitive responses we have to, to image planes, to spaces that we inhabit, to, to how we locate furniture, how we stand in a room, that those are all quite kind of, that those are based in those experiences and that, they, that they're kind of quite primary. Um, so that's, I guess, one thing. And, and then otherwise, I mean, I want to use natural materials. I mean, I'm as, as scared <laughs> of, of, every, you know, of everything that's happening as, as everyone else is. And I want to carry things into the gallery that we are really familiar with. So even if we can't touch them, like, you know, we're not usually allowed to, that you know what it feels like to, to, to sort of, well, actually you could stand on the piece of limestone and like, current show which is quite nice <laughs> um, uh, but you know if you see a wooden handle you kind of know how smooth it would feel you know what it feels like to grip something like that and so there's a kind of use of materials which are deliberately familiar or known to us and that we recognize and we can almost feel their touch or and know their presence without touching um, in the same way as we know what's outside that window without even though it's resurfaced you know so it's kind of rambly, but 
There's no, a lot, there was a lot in your question. <laughs> it's not rambly. It's a lot. Um, I noticed when you were talking there about sort of the sense of, of the refuge and the prospect and, and to how we, I guess we've come back a number of times, maybe particularly in relation to the stained glass, to I suppose the interplay between opacity and transparency. There was something that Daniel had suggested um, when we spoke a little while ago about, um, I think was it a reference back to Breton's Nadia and the kind of idea of the glass house and secrets and transparency. Um, did you want to jump in on that, Daniel? Do you want to think of that? Well, yeah, it's true that we, I, I, just because when, when, when I saw the name glass house, uh, of course, the, the first image was, or uh, the, the, the modern, the modern uh, architecture, the modern, uh, the, the glass, the glass uh, uh, buildings, but also the this ball that he, he, he well, he, this mention to the glass house on his uh, novel Nadia. That I think it's more like a, more than a house made of glass. It, it looks, it seems more like a, the ball of a clairvoyant that he has and on his collection, right? Yeah, probably was more because of this. But well, but also in on. You were, you, were, you were talking about this dialogue with plants in the way that your work is establishing. I think it was made five years, six years ago, this yeah. project, but now it seems very pertinent, right? I mean, because mm. this, this pandemic seems just a direct rehearsal of what is coming. Mm. Uh, uh, and probably we, we should start to talk more with plants and, and inviting them to, to, to our, uh, let's say, artificial environments, right? Mm. I don't know if you have any thoughts about this and in this situation that we are living and yeah <laughs> i mean i i mean i guess i'm just conscious that we we it's really hard to make work now i think it's really hard to speak about things that are too big to even understand you know so so the only way we can do it is kind of maybe talk about that problem somehow and and talk about the scale of things and and talk about small things um so it feels, that, I mean, the last, I had a show in September, last September, and it's, it's called Handle, which is a kind of a, a non-title, but it was, it was literally a, a sense of trying to get a, a hold on things. You know, I, I, I did not know how to tackle um, making a show, and I started making handles, <laughs> just small wooden handles. Um, and it, was, it wasn't as much of, I don't know how to make an exhibition. It was, it was like, I don't know how to make an exhibition now. Um, I think that that everything feels quite um, absurd in a way um, and that nature will carry on thankfully we won't um, but it will survive and evolve and and be something else and that's kind of interesting um, but to make anything at the moment feels weighty and feels like it has to be considered and it has to be um, thoughtful in regard to that um, so it is it is absolutely underlying i think most of our working lives right so. yeah what, what you what you described just there and you really put like put me suddenly in mind of some of those images from handle of those works and i'm going to describe them horribly now i'm sure but that sort of reminded me almost of like a an underarm crutch that sort of that with that with a handle with the kind of the two um the two legs i suppose and there's a sense i suppose you know that when you talked earlier about the work sort of trying and I yeah. think the the kind of the essay for the Grazer Kunstverein, there was also that kind of sense of of of, of attempting and and trying and failing, um, and there's something in that image of that object and the crutch that sort of seems like a very kind kind of acknowledgement, like you say, of the absurdity and the impossibility of the the state that we're in. That there could be this object that is providing itself almost like as a as a crutch, as a as a handle, as a as an aid, and yet kind of acknowledges its own I suppose the impossibility of its own use by virtue of the fact that it is this object in a gallery that we're certainly not going to shove under our arm or use to hop around the place. I, that's, I hadn't, that's great. I hadn't thought that in this purchase. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, that's a terrible misread, misreading of it. There's no misreading. It's like, yeah. I think that, I think when they're you're person, talking. They're personal kind of response, you know, their, their, their scale and, and mm. their relationship to the person is what, you, what you've got there called upon there so that's really important yeah wow i know that sort of in the um in the essay in the the catalogue for that book you had this beautiful essay by um claire louise bennett 
um, this text studio. And what struck me kind of as, as, as a poetry person, I got really excited reading it first because um, Bennett's prose is so exciting and in itself so kind of um, so rich and so attentive to these interactions between humans and objects and their material environments and their kind of, um, I suppose, their greenness about them and how they exist within those environments. Could you, could you talk a little maybe just about sort of the choice of, of Bennett or the, the interaction with Bennett's writing and maybe specifically in terms of how kind of you you allowed for that text to be presented in a way that was typographically really unorthodox that was quite exciting in terms of how some words were stretched or sort of spaced out further um there was a way in which the the words on the page were taking you know control of the space of the page much more so playing within it maybe performatively um could you talk a little about that that text in relation to your work yeah i mean it's a lot of it is sort of wonderful happenstance as sometimes occurs um but it I had asked her because, I mean, I think Pond is just a fantastic novel. It's just wonderful. But in particular, I, I just feel like she circles things, you know, so she never quite gets to the object she's describing sometimes or never gets to the, the, the point of the thing, but actually gets so close to it because she circumnavigates it with these descriptive sentences, like for me, over and over to the point where it's really telling you so much more than if she just described it. <laughs> I don't know, there was something about how she writes that did that. And, and it felt really similar to how I think about making work, even though it's in a completely different mode. Um, so I asked, I asked her and she thankfully said she would do something <laughs> for me. And she came to visit the studio and I gave her a complete free reign because uh -huh. I, I kind of just thought, well, if you're going to, if it's, a, if, it, if, if this kind of collaboration is an act of, of, of meeting someone mm -hmm. and that kind of, it should be generous on both sides and she should be able to just do what she felt like. And what came back is this, uh, yeah, this like play of words across the page. It's actually, I would really highly recommend that people um, who, who get to read it and it'll be in the John Hansard oh, book next year. Yeah. Yeah. But that they try and read it aloud, and she read it aloud at um, at the book launch in in Dublin, and it, it's I read it aloud uh, today, in fact, to myself uh -huh. in the studio, and it's really difficult <laughs> because the pacing and the rhythm it throws you every few seconds, and it's a stuttering and a stopping and a starting, and mm -hmm. in a way you were describing uh, how I working with moving image I mean it just seems to play out both uh, audibly and and visually a lot of the the kind of going towards something and, and, and stepping back that happens in 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 the, hopefully in the works and she hadn't actually seen the show she'd written it before the show um, had gone up and I mean the show itself involved a huge amount of kind of placement and positioning of the viewer as part of it's a kind of a choreography really it's an enormous space it was in the in the RHA in Dublin it is a big it's a really big group oh, yeah. <laughs> it just need it, it you know for me it needed all of these kinds of uh, uh, still points where you could kind of position yourself and kind of grasp what was going on so so it's a whole series of floor to ceiling steel poles which which contained held different things and allowed you to kind of uh, yeah literally grasp a point where you in in this huge empty kind of scary space where you could uh, take in what was going on and her work literally does that on the page it was extraordinary it was absolutely amazing so um, so part I mean probably rambly conversations in the studio uh, a kind of showing her bits and pieces um, you know, then talking about something else, like her journey there, you know, having some tea, you know, and the kind of that, that thing where, yeah, the big picture and the, and, and the small touch comes into play in every, in every, you know, moment, you know, you're, again, I think about you looking at the glass eyes on the screen and glancing at, you know, the, at the garden you were sitting in. I mean, it's just that, that interplay. And I think she's just described it. Yeah. I think, I think that's it. And it's almost, it almost felt like, you know, I suppose so often we're used to catalogue texts that to some degree kind of try to produce a kind of ekphrasis, but that what she had done was something that was much more embodied in that it almost kind of trained us for the kind of looking that your work also sort of solicits from the viewer, you know, that it's sort of almost like you could, you could be reading that work as a kind of primer for how you might move within the space, that you might move between kind of moving image and, and objects. Um, and like you say, that sort of sense of circling around and never quite getting something, you know, get, getting a grip on the handle and never getting quite to, 
to come fully into contact with it, but yet to keep kind of returning to it by, by various routes. It's a really, um, I think it's a, it's a kind of marvelous example of how a text within a publication of that kind can do something so much more than simply produce a description or a kind of narrative, yeah. um, you know, but, but does something that seems genuinely, like you say, a collaboration. And it's, um, it's lovely to see that done and to think about how it came, came into being like that. Um, that's kind of that's marvellous. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, Daniel, do you have any last, um, last questions you'd like to? Well, I mean, it's, it's just fascinating uh, but by just participating in this chat, especially because I'm, I'm coming from, from the world of design. Uh, yeah. I'm really uh, having a, well, all, all my, my thoughts that your work has been generated now has, has generated more questions. <laughs> uh, that I'm really, I'm really, I would like to, I mean, I, I hope very soon we are going to be able to, to cross the doors of uh, Hansel Gallery and see your work uh, physically. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, look, looking forward to this moment uh, has been. I suppose, however, however it came to be that the sort of, um, I suppose, the online glimpse that we have into your practice through Glasshouse, through Glasshouse right now, it's kind of wonderful to know that it is this sort of anticipation of the, the exhibition yeah. to come, you know, and that it does kind of give people a way to, to kind of experience it um, through their own screens, from the safety of their own homes before later being able to come into the space and exist within the space um, with the moving images, um, works and, and among the sculptures and sort of to, to do so in a way that is, is greatly informed, I think, by, by all that you've shared with us today. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Neve and, and Daniel for that. Yeah, no, thank you very much. For very thoughtful questions and, and the time and consideration that you gave to the work. You know, it's really means a lot. Only a pleasure. It only whets the appetite for the exhibition to come. But thank you, thank you both so much. <laughs> definitely so, definitely. Um, thank you very much. And thanks so much to JHG for, for making this conversation possible. Thanks all and good evening. Good night. Bye.